All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. My name is Allie and I'm your host for this evening. And as much as I wish uh, you were all here in person, we so appreciate you all showing up to support indie bookstores even online. So tonight I am so excited to be introducing Marissa Meyer and Lish McBride here to discuss Lish's new book, Curses, which comes out tomorrow. So I hope you'll all join me in wishing her a huge happy book birthday. Uh, but before we get into the fun stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in and, of course, for buying books. So for those of you who may not know, we are an independent bookstore with three locations in the Seattle area, and your support really is what keeps us here selling books, and we really love what we do. So if you also love what we do, we would so appreciate it if you swing by and grab some copies, or if you're not local, we do, of course, ship. Uh, I believe that Lish is coming in to sign copies tomorrow, so come on in over the next few days to snag your signed book, or if you order a book online with us, you will be getting a signed one. So I will be linking books in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy for you to go and track those down, and we are, of course, so, so grateful for your support. So while you are over on our website, I definitely encourage you all to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next uh, few months. And if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a really one email a week. We won't spam you. Weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs. And of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books or at Third Place Books Kids for the YA crowd um, for the quickest updates and recommendations. So we are here for about an hour and towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or the bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. Feel free to let us know where you're from or your latest favorite read. But when it comes time for questions, do make sure that those end up in the Q&A so that we can most easily find them. And I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce our dear friend, aspiring castle owner and former third place bookseller, Lish McBride, author of the award-winning Hold Me Closer Necromancer, Necromancing the Stone, Firebug, Pyromantic, and of course, the book of the evening, Curses, A Beauty and the Beast Retelling with a Boy beautiful boy and a beastly girl. So in conversation tonight, I'm so thrilled to welcome Marissa Meyer, the New York Times bestselling author of so many beloved YA staples, such as the Lunar Chronicles, the Renegades Trilogy, Heartless, The Wires, and Nerve Graphic Novels, Instant Karma, and the forthcoming Gilded, a Rumpelstiltskin retelling, which is available for pre-order. I will link in the chat. Uh, and she's also the host of the Happy Writer podcast. So they Thank you both so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, give me a shout. I will be listening. Same goes for all of you in the audience. I will keep an eye on chat. And with that, I'm going to pass the stage to our authors. Welcome. Yay. Thank you so much. Um, hi, Lish. Hi. <laughs> you look awesome. Thank you. Tell us about The Crown. Let's start there. Um, so it was actually kind of a joke that um, my agent, we, we've gotten sort of a, a bickering argument about how I'm the queen of the fishwives. Um, and my friend um, Blythe Woolston, who's another YA author, um, made me my lovely queen of the fishwives tiara. I like his little glitter glittery eye. I've had it for years now and he's starting to get less glittery, but mm -hmm. I felt if ever there was a time to wear him for an event, it was now. A we'll good how, time. We'll see how long it stays on. Yeah. Is there ever a bad time to wear an octopus crown? I can't think of any. No. No, I think you're really rocking it. It's a shark, really nice touch. Dark feeding frenzy, maybe? Potentially. But then you've got like a bait you can throw at them. There you go. I don't know. Just <laughs> Sailor Moon thing. It turns into a weapon. <laughs> Anyway, congratulations. I'm so excited for Curses coming out tomorrow. Um, I'm thrilled to have been asked to join you for tonight's launch event, so thank you. 
Um, I texted you earlier today and asked if you'd been preparing and practicing your elevator pitch because this is a conversation that, that we have a lot. Yeah. And How'd I just, you do? I love that you have to like go, Lish, have you done your homework? And at the time, <laughs> I was honestly, I just sat there and thought, I haven't done that pitch yet. Marissa's going to be so irritated if I don't. Like, so like the fact that you had to check in and say, Lish, did you do your homework? Maybe. I think I did okay. I had to write it down. So I, there was no way I was going to remember anything. But do you want it? I am ready. Let's okay. hear the pitch. What is Curses about? Curses is a gender-swapped Beauty and the Beast retelling featuring Tevin, a ridiculously handsome con man, uh, gifted with charm, and Merit, heir to her mother's barony and cursed to be a beast by a capricious fairy godling. Um, if Merit doesn't break her purse, she... Curse. <laughs> Merit doesn't break her curse, which was, makes much more sense than purse, um, she will permanently become the beast. And it's sort of a... Um, look at what fairy tale tropes, um, what happens when you kind of mix them with um, kind of swapped gender roles. And it's a lot about fairy tale gifts and curses and how they're both kind of terrible. But mostly it's, it's all those things wrapped around sort of a gooey, um, candy coated, like ridiculous heart. I mean, it's a goofy book. So it it's down. a goofy book, but it's a really sweet book, and it's a magical book. I wrote something sweet. So. I know! How unlike you! <laughs> um, okay, so I want to start by digging into fairy tales, and particularly Beauty and the Beast. Of all the fairy tales, why this one? Crystal, can you hear my dog barking right now? Yeah, a little, but it's not too okay. distracting. Apparently the mailman will buy. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, Beauty and the Beast is actually, um, oddly enough, like my favorite. It's always been my favorite, even though it's kind of a creepy fairy tale. I mean, I were, know, it's like one of my least favorites. I'm so surprised. <laughs> so it's so questionable and wrong. I mean, like the original one, where she gets traded for a flower and the Beast, who is, who is basically really nice, but in sort of a creepy terrible way just keeps saying like oh, I'm so glad you're happy here's more things also will you marry me now and it just repeats 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 until she goes home realizes her family is terrible uh goes back to him um and he's dying they never explain why he's just dying um and somehow they're in love now and it's fine but it's yeah it's just just this really kind of like everything is awful people are terrible very and I don't know why I always loved it but I think all the different retellings I don't know. There's something about it. The Disney one, especially because basically she's just, she's in it for the library. <laughs> I would also be in it for the library. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. I, mean, I like, I do like all kinds of fairy tales. I just think that that one, for whatever reason, has been one that I constantly go back to. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not alone. I mean, I think for me, hearing from readers, you know, who want more retellings, Beauty and the Beast is easily the one that comes up the most often. Um, people just love this story. And I think that it's all of those problematic things. Like, you know, there's a little bit of like Stockholm syndrome going on and like, there's a lot of weirdness in it. But I think it's easy to overlook those things because there are these deeper messages of of acceptance and you know this romantic idea of seeing beyond the surface and bringing a good person out of a beast and I think a lot of us really relate to that I think too that like there's that sort of um the trope of the you know the the grumpy one and the sunshine one and I, this that is kind of that but I think what was particularly fun about doing it the other way around is, you know, most women, when you're being raised, you're younger, um, you're sort of taught to be nice. You're taught to be friendly. You're taught to be cheerful. You're taught to smooth everything over. And to have a character who just literally can't do that. Like she growls, she tears up the furniture. She can't help it. I mean, but also she doesn't really want to help it because as a beast, people listen to her. She gets to basically be angry and it's okay. Um, which for a lot of, so it did, that did a lot of weird things to the fairy tale, um, especially flipping it over to making the beauty character be a man and what that means and what that, that would change. Um, and I, I didn't realize really how 
steeped in some of these things I am until I'm, I'm writing it and I'm, you know, you start kind of running up against that wall of what does this mean if we switch it around? And it was, it was, it was difficult, more difficult. Yeah. Where did the idea come from to do a gender swapped Beauty and the Beast? My dog is going, absolutely, they've been quiet all day and now they're just, <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying it's to- It's a puppy, don't you have a new dog? Uh, yeah, that is, that is, the, that is Boudica. That's the new one or Boo. Oh as we call her, who um, never barks, never until now. Yeah. Um, God, I'm trying to think, where did, where did I, I don't, I don't think there was anything specific. I think I was kind of just um, in my downtime thinking about these things, because this is kind of where my brain goes when apparently it's offline, like if I'm driving the car, <laughs> what would happen if you, and I realized that I couldn't think of any, um, of any versions that were swapped mm -hmm. around. They're, like there's so many retellings. Um, it's gonna drive me crazy. <laughs> the barking. Um, yeah, so there's so many retellings, but um, I couldn't, I couldn't like find a single one. I think I did eventually find um, one like young adult gender swap one that came out a few years ago, but I haven't, I haven't read it for, mm -hmm. for reasons. I mean, obviously I don't want it to Sure. Influence. Yeah. That's, I was trying yeah. to think of words. Yeah. No, I, I get that. Writing Gilded, my Rumpelstiltskin retelling. There have been a couple of uh, Rumpelstiltskin retellings that have been recommended to me or whatever. And I'm like, I would love to read that, but I have to wait till I'm done first. <laughs> you don't want to be unduly influenced. That would be another tricky one because, I mean, because um, like Rumpelstiltskin is such a kind of nasty character. And trying, yeah. trying to bring any sort of like, good goodness or redeeming qualities or like. yeah I really changed Rumpelstiltskin characters Rumpelstiltskin's character a lot I made him the love interest yeah I'm, um, I'm really, I really want to see like what you did with that because I'm yeah yeah so there's no like little goblin guy showing up there's a very handsome ghost instead <laughs> it's made more fun <laughs> I'm excited about it I am thank you so we have a female beast and we have a male beauty. Which one was more fun to write? I think, you know, um, there's certain, certainly delightful writing Merit because she is so growly and that's, that's fun for me. Um, and she's just, she hits that sweet spot for me of like, I love like, a, like the practical female character. Like the one that's just going to get it done. Like that's one of my favorite things. That being said, writing someone who's very, very charming is really fun for me. Like just having that person just go nuts with all the goofy things that they say and the ridiculousness um, and just swanning about the place, going, you know, being handsome. Like it, that was just a lot of fun, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love writing the charming characters. There's, they can get away with so much. I feel like that was part of the appeal is that, yeah, they, they have that confidence. And I think we're really drawn to confident people in real life. And so then in fiction, you get to take that and like quadruple it. <laughs> well, I think especially with him, I mean, he has so many different relationships with, I mean, when he's talking with his siblings, it was a lot of fun, but especially when he's talking with Val, because there's, um, who's his cousin, you know, there's so much love there, but they also are very straight with each other. Um, and she herself is is charming, but in a very sort of um, rustic kind of way that I, I think, them going back and forth, I think was kind of my favorite. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about world building a little bit. Um, so this is quite a change of pace for you. Your first four novels were all more kind of paranormal. They're set in a contemporary world, contemporary Seattle, contemporary Maine, but with monsters and werewolves and necromancers and things thrown in. So this is really, at least to my knowledge, um, the first time that you've really like built a brand new world. What was that like? What did you like about that? What did you hate about that? Um, so I, I do love world building. Like it is, it is something that, um, I really enjoy doing in a sense, but 
what was problematic with this one is you know, we couldn't get the story to work. Um, like I, I had to rewrite this book, like, I don't know, four times, like completely from zero, like fresh sheet of paper going back in, which I've never had to do before. Um, but every time we'd fix one thing, it would impact, like it would echo out and it basically screw up everything else. And so it was definitely more complicated. But the nice thing is that when you're making something completely up, you can just do whatever you want, um, which like, I I really enjoy, but like my editor's like, okay, but why do we have trains? And I said because I want trains. <laughs> and I said, well, the, the era that I'm sort of like mimicking, like that's kind of when industrialism was coming up, and we were losing sort of um, one kind of way of life. We're having this kind of way show up, so you you would have trains at the same time. It's like you know, all these other things, and. Um, She's like, fine, fine. You just have to make it work. And so um, I do like, I think, the problem solving aspect mm -hmm. and getting to completely make things up and go crazy with them. Um, this one, the, the, you know, the hardest thing was for me was the clothes. Because I don't pay attention to fashion at all or care about clothing. Like, if I could wear a sack and just be there, it'd be fine. Um, and so we have this character who's, who's basically, um, you know, Merit dresses very feminine, has like the ball gowns and things like that. And I was like, I know nothing about any of these things. And so after the first one, I'm like, okay, I have to, I have to start Googling like what, you know, beautiful gowns look like in this era so I can describe them because I've got, I've got nothing. And do you now have an appreciation for like, what would that be, 17th century fashion? Um, what it, is it, is it, is it, yeah, it's, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I'm in my right era there, but it's fun to look at. I would not like to wear it. No. <laughs> um, the women, like the women, like they, um, the amount of clothing that they had to put on. Mm. I mean, like just layers and layers, and it's heavy, and you know, your pockets are in this. Yeah, I just mm -mm, not interested. Yeah. Um, I always have that thought like we were having that terrible heat wave here a few weeks ago. My mind always goes to like the Victorian era or like, you know, the old South or something with the huge hoop skirts and the, or even the men in full suits. I can't even. I would, um, I'm pretty sure that anything before now, I would probably die. Like, I don't think I would survive <laughs> Victorian. I mean, a lot of people didn't. But I don't think I'd make it out if I even if I made it through the clothing and the and the diseases because I'm I don't have the most robust health. Um, surely I'd be burned as a witch. So like there was just no way I would. There's no. There's no. Way. You mentioned that you love making stuff up. Yeah. I would say one of the things you know this book is very different from your previous books, but one of the things it carries forward is like the Lish McBride signature brand of quirky. <laughs> Agreed? Yeah. <laughs> Take me into your brain and some of the weirdness that we can look forward to in curses. You know, it's funny because like to me, to me it'll seem like this is the logical next step of whatever it is. And then I show it to somebody else and they're like, but, but why? But why do the badgers have wings? I'm like, because of course they would. Why would they <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know. My brain's a weird place. There's a lot that I really enjoyed, I think, um, getting silly with this book. Because I think, I don't know, when I was writing it, my, my threshold for seriousness was very low. Um, for serious and, and dark things. And I just wanted something really fun and a little campy at times. Like goofy weirdness. I'm trying to think of like what all... The Dapper Ostrich, I think, is one of my most favorite things. And I had to argue. I had to argue for, they're like, do we need the Dapper Ostrich? I'm like, I need the Dapper Ostrich. I don't know about anyone else. The world needs the Dapper I Ostrich. In my um, God, what else did I sneak in there? I'm blanking. I'll do, I, what's a book? I've forgotten everything that's in it. Um, <laughs> How long ago did you finish writing it, do you think? I know it's been a long journey with this one. I think you've written an entire series and started like two others since I've been on this one. Um, that's not even an exaggeration. Like I think I started, I was working on it when you were starting on Renegades. So, that's right. Cause weren't we on that writing retreat together? Yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's terrible. 
Um, gosh. So I think I finished it. My edits were done over Christmas. Okay. But like, right. it, I've, I've redone it so many times. It's like, okay, am I remembering? Is that actually in the book now? Or did that get cut? Or um, I know the Fladgers are in there, which is the winged badgers. Um, I know the ostrich. Because mm -hmm. I love that. There's uh, also some very interesting gifts slash curses. It's always really fun. The yeah, so basically how the magic works is they're sort of like the fairy godparent characters. I call them fairy godlings. And they can they can grant willy-nilly, you know, gifts and curses. Their idea of what's a good idea is not what literally anyone else would think. I mean, um, and most of the ones I have in the book are things taken directly from fairy tales. So we have um, Willa and Diodora, who are the stepsisters, who one of them um, is cursed with every time she speaks, uh, snakes and toads fall from her mouth. And her sister Diodora has flowers and gems, both of which are terrible, in my opinion. Um, and then there's the girl that has her hand stuck to the golden goose, who's a barmaid. She's in there briefly. Um, there's, what else do we have in there? Kevin and his siblings are pretty basic ones. They have savvy, charm, and um, mimicry. Omri can mimic anything that he has seen. Um, oh, what else? I'm trying to remember if Everett is still in there. The toad. The head is on one of the stable... I think he's in there briefly. The way basically he's, on, he's on the head of a stable boy. And if he um, doesn't keep the toad fed, it will start yeah. to... Eat. Yeah, and that's it's from a fairy tale. I can't remember which one, um, but he's friends with the toad. Like he's actually like they they formed a bond. I think it's very upset worrying about Everett. Um, so basically, all the really terrible things I picked were straight out of fairy tales. I mean, some of the more obscure ones for sure. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that you really kind of did a deep dive into Grimm. Um, and of course, Beauty and the Beast, um, which is not a grim fairy tale, but nevertheless, still in that, that same vein. Um, but it's so well known, so beloved. Uh, and I love that throughout you're paying homage to some of these more obscure ones that us total nerds are going to totally nerd out about. I, I, wrote a, I wrote papers on fairy tales in college. Me too! <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're friends. I mean, yeah. um, and, uh, I could, I could really, I could still very much like break down uh, Little Red Riding Hood for you and how really weird that fairy tale is. Yeah, now that one has a lot of bizarre stuff from its. Okay. It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I was gonna go somewhere, but now you have me thinking about totally bizarre fairy tales. And I remember writing a paper about Sleeping Beauty and like all of the weird symbolism in that one. There's strange stuff. I'm trying to remember, is, um, is, is it Snow White or Sleeping Beauty where she wakes up with children? Or like she went to Sleeping sleep Beauty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's actually them yeah. uh, breastfeeding that is what wakes her up. Yeah, that's terrifying. Yeah. I know. Just... Um, on that note, are there any fairy tales that you really love that you feel like either you would like to adapt someday or maybe that you just feel like this one is underappreciated? Um, you know, well, there are a lot I would do. If I get to write more in, um, in this world, there are definitely some that I already have lined up, um, uh, that we've already, we've already mentioned a little bit. Um, you know, there's, there's one I would love, I've never been able to think of a story to do it, but, and it's not a fairy tale, it's Greek mythology, but I would love to rewrite, um, the Cerberus tale. Because Cerberus is the three-headed dog, you know, that, um, right. of Hades. And his tale is really, really depressing. Um, like he basically, Hades wants him as the guard dog. He doesn't want to do it because he has a best friend that he loves her and they just, you know, live together and everything is great. So um, Hades kills his friend and takes her, takes her shade in the underworld. So basically if he wants to follow his friend, he has to go guard the, the gates. Um, which, and I'm like, that's awful. Like that's just, he was a good dog with, three heads but a good dog the best boy um yeah so i like i would love to retell that one oh that's sad you know, i brought us down mm -hmm. that's what i do it would make a good uh graphic novel though i know i just can't think of what spin i'd want to do on it i mean yeah. it would, the, 
for curses, like if I could do the sequels, it would be the next one would be following the stepsisters, um, Diodora and Willa, and then and and Latimer the Troll Prince, which always a good time. Um, and then after that, I think I would do Kate's story, which I'm pretty sure would be kind of a Puss in Boots take, but. Mm -hmm. It's one of my uh, favorites. It's one of your favorites, but I also know that like you tried it and was like, this doesn't, this is hard. And so I don't know. Um, no, well, I wrote a Puss in Boots like as a fan fiction ages ago. Um, it's kind of different. I actually attempted a Beauty and the Beast and that I couldn't pull off. I got so lost and mucky with it and was like, nope, done, moving on. <laughs> so if you ever, if you ever go back in, um, Here's here's what if I if I'd realized this, my editor actually figured it out before I did. If I'd realized this, I think it would have saved us so many drafts. The problem with Beauty and the Beast is there's no because usually you've got a storyline and a B storyline, and A is your main thing. Beauty mm. and the Beast, there's really no A. There's not. There's nothing there. The the, the, the Disney one, they that's why they threw in Gaston and all that. Sure. Other. Yeah. You've got a driving force. The original one, there really isn't much there. Like, yeah. It's just kind of like. And, it, and what is there is pretty passive. It's so yeah. If we had just figured that out earlier. Have you ever read the, uh, my pronunciation, it's French, so meh, um, but Villeneuve, Villeneuve version, um, where it actually like goes into the whole backstory of like how he became cursed. And there's this whole thing where Belle or Beauty is like descended from fairies, et cetera, et cetera. It's I was long. couldn't believe when I read that one. I was like, the backstory is so much more interesting than the part that everybody actually knows. And it's it is it, like I it, it just goes on forever. Like that's it is. Like, it's so it's long. It's like a small novel. novel. <laughs> yeah, I've read a lot of like the old, the old versions. Yeah, and I read that one I think a couple years ago when I was trying to figure this one out. But mm -hmm. there's so much in there where I'm like, nope, we can't. Nope. Yeah, yeah. Cool. No, it would really. I mean, it would just, to try to do anything with it, it'd be like, hey, we're scrapping this, starting yeah. over again. <laughs> um, let's talk writing a little bit. Okay. What do you like about writing? Um, so I know a lot of people get really frustrated during the drafting process, but I think that's my favorite because you don't really have to worry about it actually working yet. You're just making things up um, and making up characters. And I, I love making up characters a little too much where like <laughs> my casts are always too big um and I know that people like there's gonna be definitely some people that pick up curses and be like nope too many people and uh, <laughs> that makes me laugh because there was more and we cut like every every time we do a draft my editor's like who can I take away um which hurt it hurt me but yeah. so I love I love that part I love the the making things up part um and I like talking to readers the editing process makes me want to set things on fire. <laughs> it's the worst. It's the, mo it's the most important part, I think, in lots of ways. But mm -hmm. um, it, it makes me really surly. Yeah. And I know you are a panther. Yeah. You make it up as you go. Is that part of the reason you think why you like drafting so much, though, is because you don't know where it's heading? That might be part of it. It's sort of like revealing bits by bit by bit, because um, I usually can just like I know the next scene maybe, and then after that it's kind of like mystery. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think there is I think there is some of that. I like the the puzzle part where you're figuring things out. Um, I also I like the research too, even though I don't like to be factual necessarily. That's part of the, the, the fantasy aspect where I'm like, I'm going to take enough data to make it sound realistic, but I'm going to do what I want mm -hmm. not based on anything specific. Like I, I don't think I could do actual historical fiction. It's just too, um, too detailed. I, I, would, I would be bad at it, I think. Yeah. No, I, I have said this many times. I love historical fiction. I love reading it. Mm -hmm. Um, I was in an anthology years ago, a historical fiction anthology, and had to write my, you know, 8,000 word historical fiction short story. And I researched more for that short story than like for all of my previous books combined. And I was like, never again to try to do this for an entire novel. No, no. Yeah. I have friends that do it and they're great and I love them and I like reading their stuff and I love talking to them about research. Yeah. But if I had to do it myself, 
I did a, um, I helped a friend with a nonfiction project about sharks and mm. I was writing some of the, some of the things. And I would spend like three or four hours researching a few things just to write like a paragraph. And I'm like, I can't, this is never again. Yeah. I do it. I'm not patient enough. Mm -mm. Yeah. I think there has to be like a really big passion for whatever it is that you're researching. Like there just has to be something that you love and could read about it all day long. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and, I, and I do have a lot of, um, weird interests and things that basically like I have to deep dive for books um but I love again I love I love that learning aspect I just don't necessarily want to be beholden to the actual facts like I'm like I want I want to learn all the things but maybe I don't want to, have to necessarily do them yeah yeah um, no and you mentioned puzzle solving and I for me that's probably my favorite part about writing I love like when you're stuck and things you can't get things to come together and there's something about the story that's just like really frustrating you and really driving you nuts and then all of a sudden that light bulb goes off and you know how to fix it and it all comes together beautifully that's like it's magic that's I get so excited about that and I don't know about you um but like the things that I do to make that happen um were really difficult for the last year or so because usually I either um I either talk it out so like mm -hmm. I get together with a couple of writing friends and we sit down and um if I get stuck then Something about the process of discussing it, like I don't necessarily even have to get to the point where they respond. Just something about me articulating it will, will kind of crack it open in my head. Um, so either that, which got a little difficult, or um, some like the mindless like driving places and you know, which I'm not, I wasn't driving anywhere. And there was not the things where your brain kind of gets to go off in its own. Yeah. Its own, it wasn't happening. Right. For me, a lot of times it's travel or like being on vacation, sitting on a beach somewhere or, you know, or definitely driving someplace. Yeah. You get a lot of those ideas. You're like, you're not at work anymore. You've got some time off. And that's when your brain is like, let me tell you all the story ideas. You thought you were going to work. We're going to work hard. <laughs> And then work more hard. Like, yes. <laughs> when you get home from this trip, you will have six new book contracts. <laughs> I kept yelling at my mom that napping was part of my mom lives with us. And we kept saying, you know, napping is part of the process. <laughs> but it is. It is part of the process. I yeah. Mean, I don't know. It's it's letting letting your brain go for a little bit. Yeah. You can at least I know you you can um, unlike me, you can actually plot. <laughs> like where you you do outlines don't you pretty I do I do outlines um they always change though but I've, I'm trying this new thing with the sequel to Gilded so I have my outline like and for me it's very basic like every chapter here's like one sentence about what happens in that chapter it's pretty minimal um and now I've started doing this thing where at the start of every week, I will look at like the next three or four chapters and outline those in detail and haven't written a whole book this way. So we'll see. But so far it's going really good because it like forces me to like really pause and be like, okay, we think we're heading in this direction, but actually what do these next chapters look like? And is that the right direction? And it like gives me time to move things around before... I get too deep into it. It just seems so much more sensible than the way that I do it. I just don't like, <laughs> if I could. Um, I, the, this with the last, I think, big run through on curses, I did do a reverse outline. And that where you go through and basically read a chapter, write a sentence or two, mm -hmm. and what happened and move on. Um, and that was helpful. Apparently I can yeah. do that. I can do reverse outlines. But so, yeah. And then did you then use that for your revisions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. because otherwise like especially with um things being digital now like I don't always print stuff out yeah. I don't always realize that um scenes have gone on too long or you know, at one point I think my editor's like you're in the forest for like 80 pages it's like that is too long in the forest I'm like I feel like that's a metaphor for my life <laughs> oh, yeah. it's too long in the forest and I, I hadn't printed it out so I didn't realize that I'd been in there for right yeah. right so what about like writing rituals or what do you do to like pause? I know you have a busy life. You've, you've got a family, you've got kids. What do you do to help yourself switch over into writing mode? Um, 
weird. I mean, one of the things I've learned is sometimes, you know, focus, focus can be really hard. Um, and when you have a child that's repeatedly interrupting you for things, um, especially when you can't go anywhere. Um, so finding kind of like a space and having um, a routine. So like basically right now, twice a week, um, I meet up uh, with a couple of writer friends like on, on Zoom and we talk for a few minutes and then basically time out. Okay, I'll check back in in 45. So kind of that accountability and sitting down um, and same day, same time every week. Um, I usually have headphones, like the, the over the ear noise canceling kind. Um, that is the biggest thing for me, even if I don't have them turned on. Something about putting them on, it's sort of that um, Pavlovian response. Headphones are on, we're writing now. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounds like a weird thing, like why does that work? Like why does putting on headphones, they're not magic, um, but they do, they help me focus in a weird way. Um, I listen to music a lot. I don't know, someone's telling me I should tell about talk about the murder shack. Tell us about the murder shack. <laughs> So um, I don't have an office. I wish I had one. Like right now I'm basically in like the middle of our house. And this is where I used to write when the kids went to school. But then for a while they weren't going to school. Um, so basically my, my husband has a shop after the off of the garage. And he put a little desk in there for me. And he's like, you can come in here and you can write it right here. And I'll be over here doing my crafty things. Um, it's not fully finished inside, and it basically looked like the like where you would take someone to murder them. I mean, it, it is um, especially with uh, the he's got like rusty hand scythes in there and tools and like skulls and all kinds of things. It does not look like a safe place. Um, and so we started calling it the murder shack, which uh, actually was really helpful because to have somewhere to go that was quiet where the kids left me alone. And then the family leaned into the theme and um, I came in one day and uh, my son and my husband had painted like bloody handprints <laughs> on one of the walls. And then there's a silhouette of someone holding a knife behind me. I, I forget that they're behind me. And then I sometimes have to do like Zoom writing workshops. <laughs> and I'll all of a sudden realize like people, like I'm talking to a woman kind of <laughs> doing this, trying to, yeah. Look behind you! That's right, so behind me looks really scary, but the, uh, the window that I face, it's actually kind of um, lots of plants, and there's some bird feeders, and there's some... <laughs> you know, it's very nice to look there, and then everything murder behind. <laughs> Birds in the front. It's, yeah. It, it's been great. Like, someday I do want, like, in my, in my dreams, an actual office would be fantastic. Not full. I think you would miss the murder shack. A little bit, you know? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So you mentioned doing Zoom writing sprees with some friends. How has the last year, pandemic year, changed how you've written? And just kind of in general, how, how has it been writing for you during the pandemic? So I was lucky that I was I was still able to write. A lot of a lot of friends that I have couldn't. I mean, um, it's a sort of thing. It's it's a creative job, and when your brain is on fire because everything else is on fire, it's hard. Um, it's hard to give give yourself that time or have that sort of free space in your brain, um, especially with I was trying to write something funny and light. Interesting. It was like it was a nice escape, but at the same time, it was also really difficult to be funny when everything didn't feel very funny. Um, and I, I wrote more, I think, as much as I normally do, if not a little more. I mean, because that's basically, I was going out and writing all the time and it was sort of a nice escape. Um, definitely needed the murder shack for that. I did miss, and I'm glad we can finally do like the meetups that we did. I used to also meet up once a week with a couple of writer friends to um, third place books. We sit in the commons area and get coffee and write. And I, I hope we get to do that again someday because I do miss that. I like yeah. leaving my house and getting writing done. And so, yeah, it changed a lot. Um, it also, I think, gave me some permission to work on really ridiculous fun product projects that were separate than what I was doing for, for curses and just have to remind myself that this is it's supposed to be fun. We're supposed to be playing, essentially. And sometimes when you're working through publishing, it's hard to remember that this is fun. Um, mm -hmm. And so, like, I think 
I think there was a lot of that. I had to just basically remind myself a lot, like, hey, this is this is why we got into this in the first place. Um, and so, I don't know. It's there were a lot of good things that came out of it. I'm glad it's hopefully fading now and getting to see people and everything. Um, but yeah, it also feels like I didn't do anything for like a year. Like if I try to remember, it feels like my brain just goes, nope, we skipped a year. And so yeah. I'll be like, I didn't accomplish anything. My husband's like, didn't you write like three books? Oh, right. <laughs> but, but that's gone now. It's just out of my brain. That never happened. Um, <laughs> I found there's this like psychological something or other phenomenon, I guess. Um, that's like the things you do repeatedly, your brain doesn't see any value in storing those memories. So you forget about them. And that's why like, you don't remember driving to work or the grocery store or whatever. And I've, I've come to realize that writing books is the same way. Like, because I sit down and write just about every day. Then by the time a book is done, I'm like, where did this book come from? I don't remember sitting down and writing. This. Even better, like once it's done, it's gone from my head. So like, then, <laughs> then, then like a year goes, publishing is slow. So like a year goes by and you go out and these things and people are like, tell me about your book. And I'm like, uh, can't do it. I can't, like, I, especially, and if it's been longer, forget it. Like, um, I'll have occasionally people will ask me about like my first book, the question. I'm like, I don't remember anything. Like it's gone. I, I remember the main characters. I think some of the some of the plot ish like it's I'm I'm better at remembering other people's books like I can give you probably detailed explanations of the books I've been reading over the past year or two but my own once it's once it's done it's gone yeah yeah just in time for readers to start asking you like very specific questions what was this person thinking in chapter thirty two when they were got no idea I'll forget absolutely no idea the names. <laughs> the names will be gone but they, and or and I get some really um, pretty specific questions. Like at one point, someone asked me about the um, genetics in Firebug. And I was like, okay, I know I worked it out, but now I don't remember it. And so basically, mm -hmm. I had to get on Twitter and be like, hey, anyone else who's read the book, can you, did I screw this up? Or am I, and then, so I had, people got on and basically did did the homework for me. Like, no, 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 this is the work. <laughs> Three <Hey>, readers. <laughs> I remember doing it, but I'd like, once, I've, once I used it, the information is gone. Yeah. 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 Well, I don't want to skip to Q&A until we have had just a second to admire your beautiful book cover. Talk about the book cover. It's so great. It is actually, um, so I've been really lucky with covers. I think I've had, um, I've been really happy with, with all my book covers. This one, I think, in particular, because I had a lot of um, input, like there was uh, several stages. They they would show me kind of the mock-ups and we'd have a discussion about what, what I wanted on there. And so like they added some really cute details to the um, mirror was one of our things. They changed some of the, I think originally my name was in cursive and I told them no, because a lot of uh, teens aren't taught to read cursive anymore. And so I'm like, if this is supposed to be a book for teens and we make it so they cannot read the cover, this is a problem. Um, but yeah, the, the artists and I'm, who is it? Um, let's see, Tara Phillips and Christy, oh, I'm going to screw up her name, Radwalowski, the people that worked on the cover, I think they did an amazing job. Like, honestly, it's gorgeous. I love the face. Um, I just look at it. It's, it's really pretty. It's a great job. I don't know, I feel like the last year, there's just been some really amazing young adult covers, though, too. I mean, I keep seeing things, things I'm like, oh, that's gorgeous. Like, just more. Yeah. And more. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if maybe I'm just, I'm home more. And so I'm just more easily, I don't think it's because I'm more easily impressed. I think they've really done, I don't know, an amazing job on the covers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like when you and I were first getting into YA, or even like the, the kind of the generation before us, there was, I felt like covers all, were often falling into these cliches of like the all you saw was the girl head down, big poofy ball gown. And like how many millions of those were out there? Girls um, couldn't have heads. That was not a thing they could have. Um, yeah. Yeah, there was, uh, or, there were a lot of it was the, um, the photographic covers too. They wanted, um, I think when Hold Me Closer came out, that's, we had, we had this really cool mock-up for the advanced copy that I loved, which was like a retro movie, um, movie monster kind of poster thing. Oh, cool. 
um, that I loved. And I was like, oh, this is great. And for, like, I, I knew enough other writers at the point that I was like, oh, I love it. Something's gonna happen to take it away. And something <laughs> happened to take it away. Um, and basically, uh, there was there was some some people that wouldn't stock it if we didn't change the cover. And so we had to change the cover last minute. And the hardcover thing turned out fine. It was fine. I it I love if I hadn't loved the arc so much, maybe I'd have loved it more. The paperback for Hold Me Closer is a lot closer to what the original arc looked like. And I, I do like the paperback. But um, yeah, the, the all the covers back then had kind of like the very serious mopey teen face if they had it. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish I kept it, but there was a, there was a mock up at one point of Hold Me Closer where it had the serious mopey teen face, and then below that it said, "This is a very funny book." I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it looks very emo at this point, and yeah. you know, so yeah, I think I think they've they've uh, they've gotten over the notion that illustrated covers for teens are bad which um, yeah no there's been so many gorgeous ones lately i always thought that was ridiculous i'm like that's that's whatever okay yeah well not, and not, trends not. come and go but but i feel like they've they've branched out and gotten really creative with them and so there's just been a ton that have come out that are just absolutely gorgeous um, yeah yeah i agree should we open it up to q a well, we, we actually have questions look at that do you want do you want me oh. to yeah. Um, no, let me do it. Hold on. Okay. I'm getting my screen set up. Um, do you have a job in addition to writing? If so, how do you manage your time? And if not, how did you find the confidence to rely on writing as your full-time career? I feel like we have very different answers to this. <laughs> um, mine is, I had a full-time job until, until I sold curses. I, I had a full-time job Oh, yeah, for the first four books. Um, and I was doing freelance work and, you know, children um, <clears throat> who like attention and want to be fed sometimes. Basically, and I've, I read some advice really early on that I think if you're juggling a lot of things, um, that was actually, I think, from a, a writer, Kelly Armstrong, where she was talking about how she would set up time, like, this is my writing time. And it could be, you know, 20 minutes, an hour, however much you could whittle out of your day or your week. And she would treat it like an appointment. Like this is, you know, like I have to go to the dentist. I have to go, you know, write. And this is my time. And giving it that respect and that weight so that you wouldn't just like, well, but there's laundry. There's always going to be laundry. You know, there's always going to be these other things. And so you have to sort of sometimes let some things slide. Um, and hopefully, if you're really lucky, you have a very supportive team behind you. Like my family is always been really supportive. There's never been the um, treating it like a hobby kind of thing. It's always, you know, when I went to college for writing, my husband's like, yeah, of course you should go. Like that we should, we'll do what we can to make this happen. Um, and so it was great to have that support. But yeah, basically giving it that, that time, like, and also um, even if it's just short. So like for a lot of people that are really, really busy or, you know, parents, people that are juggling college and stuff too, even if it's 15 minutes in the morning when you get up mm -hmm. um, and just sitting there and putting all you can into that 15 minutes. Eventually, I mean, you end up with a book, like it, it, it does add up. So that was, I think, I don't, I didn't have much of a social life, I guess, that was <laughs> part of it. but I was only able, once we sold curses and um, my mom also came to live with us. And so that like defrayed some of our expenses. Um, that was the only way I could do it. And, and knowing full well that at some point I might have to go get another job. I mean, it happens. But. Yeah, my story, like you say, very different. Um, I was super, so before Cinder, the Lunar Chronicle sold, um, I was working as like a freelance proofreader. And so I was under contract for various um, proofreading jobs at the time. And the Lunar Chronicle sold, um, and I sold it as a four book series. And I was really, really lucky that my advance amount was enough for me to live on for a couple of years. Um, and so I pretty much called up my, the people that I was freelancing for and said, this is happening. I will finish out my contracts, but after then I'm going to try the full-time writer gig. Um, and that has been my life ever since, which has been awesome. Um, but I do think it's really interesting that before you become a full-time writer, there is this idea of like, oh, if I didn't have another job, 
I would have all day long to write. And you just it'd have this fantasy of hours and hours of free time. And, oh, I'll just be able to immerse myself in my novel all the time. And that is not the reality, at least not for most of us. Um, well, other yeah, things are constantly cropping up. I think there's a lot of things. Th there's two, I think, things that like that um, new writers and other people don't really know. One is that there's a lot of uh, other things attached to the job of writing besides actual writing. Yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> some of that is it used to be blog posts, so that's less of a thing now. But like mm -hmm. media stuff, responding to emails, doing yeah. doing things like this, which are a lot of fun, but also like it takes your time. Um, and, and the way that they think authors get paid. Um, and I think I think that a lot of us make a lot more than we do, which we don't um, for the most part. But I think, I'm trying to remember, I read somewhere that for most published, like traditionally published authors, they usually have to have a day job at least until like book five. Mm -hmm. um, that's, I think, making a lot of assumptions of like the book's actually doing okay. And um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. It's, a crazy, it's a crazy juggling act. And it, it does mean that a lot of us end up burned out and you know leave the industry which i can understand there's definitely times where i'm like maybe maybe i should just become a goat herder full time like what can i do like you know <laughs> there's there's I'm always that option i would i'd be a terrible goat herder but it's, <laughs> it's there um okay this is funny there's a question for me about renegades and arch enemies um and the question is asking about a character named hawthorne who was evidently listed in the anarchist column in the cast introduction at the beginning of the book um uh, but wasn't there in renegades and supernova the actual book didn't mention hawthorne being affiliated with the anarchist does this mean she possibly has a hidden backstory with the anarchists um, it seriously took me most of while you were answering the last question to try to remember who the heck Hawthorne was, <laughs> like we were saying before. Yep, it's gone. <laughs> um, but I did find that, like, oh yes, okay, that's right. Um, yeah, the, the cast of characters, I think they just didn't want, like, a separate bracket for non-anarchist villains, so they just lumped her in with the anarchists, um, but no, she was not technically an anarchist. And I don't like so the curse is it's the first time I've gotten a cast of characters and I don't know about you by the by the time you hit copy editing with us where they're where they're doing that where they're grouping them and putting them to look mm -hmm. nice um, I'm tired and I don't care anymore like fine, <laughs> fine. fine. Like, um, yeah I hope we're like by the time we get to writing flap copy or like the the summary that goes on the jacket flap or on the back of the book um and they're usually using something that you wrote like a year ago to be like this is the book I think I'm writing and there's been so many times where I'm like well this isn't technically true anymore but it sounds good so let's just go with that Lovely. um that actually so the second book Necromancing the Stone th that happened where we ended up um changing the plot I think fairly drastically at one point and they released the first version for um, for bookstores and stuff. So if you like looked it up at the bookstore, that was the summary and it wasn't true anymore. And it wasn't true in the book at all, like once it was published. And so um, every once in a while I'd have to do an event or something and they would, they would read that summary and I'm like, nope. But luckily you had been practicing your elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think that was the, what, I, I toured with you on that book. And I oh, was that the one? Yeah, yeah. I think so. And I was basically just watching you, like, because you were so good at pitching. I'm like, I'm just going to see what Marissa does <laughs> and learn and learn, like, just through osmosis. And I don't know if that worked, but. I <laughs> like that you tried. <laughs> Josh Poole asks, what would you do if you weren't a writer? Obviously, goat herder. Goat herder's on there. Um. Oh gosh, you know, I don't know. I, I don't think, I wouldn't be able to quit writing. I, I might quit publishing. Like I could, I could see, well, I don't see that happening anytime soon, but um, that would be, I think, where my frustration level would lie. But I get really grouchy if I don't write. Like mm -hmm. I become a, just a terrible person. And yeah. I, but if I didn't do that for, for money, um, I don't know, most of the jobs that interest me are quite creepy. I do, I've worked in a lot of bookstores. I've done that. I've worked in bakeries. Um, but uh, I don't know what I would go do. 
I don't, I don't think I'd be particularly good at anything specific. I don't think I'd be terrible at it. So I don't, what would you, do you have, do you have like a backup plan? I don't think you need one. But. Um, I mean, I was really happy freelancing um, and doing editing and, and proofreading work. So probably would have just continued with that. Um, but like my so not practical would never actually happen, but my dream would have been archaeologist. Like, oh, yeah. I just think archaeology is so cool. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know what I would do. I mean, I wanted to be a writer even when I was very little. And then yeah, I, wanted to be, I wanted to be a veterinarian for a while. Um, and then I realized like what they do as part of their job. And you have to like poke puppies with needles. And I'm like, nope, hard pass. So that, and I did, I worked at a vet clinic for like um, two and a half, three years. Um, and that was enough to basically make me realize that I would never, ever want that job. It's hard um and heartbreaking half the time and so I'd rather make stuff up all right I think we've got um just a few questions left and like one minute so it's speed round okay do you create playlists for your books nope would curses have a theme song um I no, I I listen to a lot of classical stuff and everything like I, I listen to all of all kinds of music especially when I'm writing um like Hold Me Closer and Necromancy in Stone kind of have a playlist because their chapters are song titles, but I oh, don't- Oh, that's right. That was a cool thing. I like that. I don't that. listen to anything specific when I, it's, how do I, how do I feel that day? What do I want to listen to? And it's, it is seriously anything from like classical to- Okay, speed round list. How do you come up with your titles? <laughs> Poorly. <laughs> Curses was a placeholder title and it's still there. So I don't know. I'm not good at it. Are you, how, how about you? How do you come up with yours? Just wait and hope something pops into my head. Usually it does. Sometimes I have to sit and like make a long list and pick one. Yeah. Um, have you ever gone back and read a finished book of yours? No. Marissa, that's me. Would you ever consider going back to the Lunar Chronicles? Um, I would consider it. Never say never. Um, I have right now an idea for a kind of weird, quirky Lunar Chronicles related side thing that I'm hoping to do for the Cinder 10 year anniversary next year. We'll see if it happens. It has been 10 years. Oh. Last question. Have you listened to the podcast Tales? They do original fairy tale stories. I have not. Um, I'm bad at listening to podcasts with any sort of regularity. I mean, I'm just, there's somebody I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds great. I've listened to like a, a lot of Welcome to Night Vale, but um, even though that's right up my alley, I keep forgetting that it's, it's there. I don't, I've listened to your podcast, but that's, a, yeah, but I'm just, I'm not good at listening to them. With any yeah. There's, I love podcasts, but it's hard to choose between listening to a podcast and listening to an audiobook. Audiobook wins with me like, every time because I have such a backlog that I'm trying to get through. <sighs> All right. I, did I miss anybody? I don't know. We're out of time, but I hope I got everybody who asked a question there. I think, I think you did it. I think you did it. Oh, there's one about, what is this? Do you think co-authored works are harder to pitch than single author manuscripts? I don't know. It would sort of depend, I think, a little bit on, um, I don't think it would really matter, actually. I, I don't mean, think it would really matter some, either. There's some trickiness with if you're already under contract to other publishing houses, like separate. Like if I, I'm on, I'm on Penguin now and you're on um, Taiwan Friends, right? Mm-hmm. So, like, if we co-authored something, there'd be a lot more paperwork. But I, I don't think it would be necessarily tricky. I think if they liked the book, they'd like the book. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. They figure out how to make it work. Awesome. Thanks for so many great questions, guys. Hello. Welcome I'm back. Welcome back. <laughs> Why, thank you. <laughs> Um, well, all right. I, I mean, I think it's time that we just about time we call it a night. So um, friends in chat, if you would like to snag a copy of Curses, go ahead and here, let me even just link it one more time. There's been a lot of chatting since then. So I am linking Curses first, and I'm linking Gilded second. So go ahead and go grab your copy of Curses. Pre-order a copy of Gilded. Um, I'm sorry, what was that? When does Gilded come out? November 2nd. Coming right up. 
I'm so excited. <laughs> I mean, a handsome ghost Rumpelstiltskin. I'm here for Hi. it. Hi. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So thank you, thank you both so, so much for being here. Audience members, you have been lovely. This has been such a great conversation. Um, as always, everyone, uh, head over to social media or let us know in person what you thought of this event. This is going to be on YouTube here in just a couple of days. So keep an eye on your inboxes. You can go watch it again or send it to your friends. And I think with that, we, I think it's time for some awkward waving. <laughs> one more, yeah. So one more huge thank you to Lish and Marissa, and I think now. Thank you, and thank you, third place. Yes, thank you. Good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>